What up, gang? This is Ken Zerk, Ken Zilling, and Zika Milling, and the Villain Filler Trilogy, and we are back on Umi Neko no Naku Koro Ni. It's the same day as the last episode. I just took a little break, and I'm back on it, man. All that could be heard was the sound of the rain, the voices from the t kids' TV program Mario was watching, and the engrossed Mario's cackling voice. In other words, what greeted them as they returned, dumbfounded from that horrible, bizarre scene, was the voice of Maria as she rolled around laughing at the TV. Those who returned to the dorm didn't know how to explain to Maria that her mother was dead and were trapped by a suffocating silence. At first, Maria returned their stares with dubious looks, with a dubious look, but when she realized they weren't trying to blame her for anything, she ignored them and again immersed herself in the TV program. The children wordlessly sat down heavily on the sofa. Their minds were probably blank from their state of shock. Everyone had already cried and mourned so much, but now they just vaguely sat there, their faces seeming to have lost all emotion. Only Kanan had returned to his usual calm expression. However, that probably didn't mean that he'd been able to wipe out the shock. Nothing was reflected in his eyes as he stared into empty space. Hideyoshi kept on fidgeting, and every time he remembered that horrible scene, he started muttering about it how he couldn't believe it, how it couldn't have been something from this world, how it must have been the work of demons. Every now and then his mutterings produced a question directed at Nanja, but the latter kept repeating in a calm, doctor-like manner that nothing could be understood by only glancing at the scene, and that until the police arrived they wouldn't learn anything. However, Nanjo only appeared calm next to Hideyoshi, who simply couldn't suppress his agitation and fear. In fact, Nanjo had also received a huge shock, and his face was a deathly pale. Maybe that atmosphere is why she tried to rise to the challenge and take charge. Nanjo, he appeared to be unchanged from her normal attitude, and she briskly gave directions. I will go see father. Genji, quickly, contact the police. Certainly. I wonder if you would allow me to tag along, Natsuhi. Since Kraus is now gone, the task of aiding father has been left to me. It would be improper of me to relax her while relying entirely on you. Natsuhi was struck speechless by Ava's aggressive move in a situation like this. She seemed to be claiming with Kraus dead, the one to take responsibility shouldn't be his wife but herself, the next highly ranked in the family. Or maybe she hadn't been at all happy when Natsuhi took command without reference to her in such an extreme situation. However, Ava's mind had been blank from shock until a moment ago. She only came to her senses after Natsuhi started giving orders. Just do as you like. Natsuhi started walking without saying a word more. This is not the time to be petty, bitch! This is not the fucking time to be petty. Nigga, your family is dead. You just lost about... You done lost about three family members and you trying to be petty, bitch. I can't... Yo, you really pissing me off. Ava followed behind her. As they did, Kumasawa ran into the parlor. She usually wasn't the kind of person to run around. So under normal conditions, most people would have taken her entrance as a sign that something was the matter. But because everyone was still stricken with shock, they hardly even noticed her. <sighs> Madam! Madam! If you're looking for Nazuhi, she went to see Father. She'll probably be back soon. What happened, Kumasawa? You see, in the dining hall, there was blood, blood! The ears of everyone in the parlor twitched. Everyone thought the same thing. I hope I misheard that. Any, con any container can only hold so much, and no one here would be capable of handling yet another tragedy. So they all thought it. I hope I misheard that. No. No, what happened? In the dining hall? When I went to the dining hall to set up for breakfast, the first one to start running was George. 
His harsh footsteps jogged Hideyoshi and Nanjo to their senses and they chased after him. Battler and the others followed. They flew into the dining hall one after another, but they didn't find any change that might have caused Kumasawa to go pale. To those who had viewed that gruesome scene in the storehouse, it was a bit of an anticlimax. However, Kumasawa, who had followed them, pointed it out. There really was some traces of blood remaining on the floor. Compared to that terrible scene, it wasn't very impressive. However, if you calmly thought about it, this definitely indicated the loss of a lot of blood. There's another puddle over here. What in the world? It appears that a great deal of time has passed. It's probably safe to say they were killed here last night. It definitely looks that way. We were talking together in the dining hall until late into the night. After that, someone must have forced their way in. Dad, when did you and Mom slip out of the meeting and go to sleep? It was a little past midnight. So... We should probably assume it happened after that. Are you kidding me? Give me a break. Milady, please stay strong. After seeing that hell on earth in the storehouse, this is nothing. Really? Good for you. Feel like my head's gonna explode. This is the dining hall, right? Every day this is where I'd eat, complain about school, complain about homework, talk to my dad about my grades. That's what this place is to me. Lady, it wouldn't be good to remain here any longer. Let's return to the parlor. I agree. Uncle Hideyoshi, I think this room would be really important to the police. Do you think it'd be bad if we trampled all over it? Battle it proposes in a slightly firm voice, as along with Kanan, he grabbed the pail and shaking Jessica's shoulders. Everything is just as Battler has said. There is nothing more to be gained from remaining in this room. Nanjo spoke while looking at everyone's pale faces. Even though that horrible scene in the storehouse felt like nothing, something not of this world. At least then we'd be able to leave and cut ourselves off from that place and run away. Everyone had shared that feeling. However, this dining hall was different. It was in the mansion, the main building on the estate. And as Jessica had said, it should have been one of the most calming places even inside the mansion. It was where all of the relatives had eaten lunch and dinner yesterday. The shock, of seeing this the, the shock of seeing this place smeared with blood reminded us of that horrible spectacle in the storehouse and forced us to accept that we'd really hadn't forced us to accept that we hadn't really been able to run away from the scene of that tragedy. Mm. Mm. I agree too. The culprit might have left traces in this room. Amateurs like us should have stirred the place up. Let's leave quickly. Quickly, quickly. Hideyoshi also understood the meaning of what Bidler said and pushed everyone to hurry out of the dining hall. The way we were then, looking at the blood any longer would have been too harsh. Nobody went against his words. Everyone raced each other out of the dining hall. It was almost as though the last person in the room would be trapped in there all alone. Once in the hallway, we lent a hand to Kumasawa, who was still trembling and leaning against the wall, and we all headed back to the parlor together. Then Genji returned. Oh, Genji! Were you able to contact the police? As to that, I'm afraid I must apologize. Well, shit. I don't know if it was a failure of the radio or something else that caused it, but... What the? So you couldn't contact the police? Both the phone and the radio failed? My apologies. A boat will be arriving on Monday morning. 
and I believe we'll be able to borrow their communications equipment. Isn't there a boat on this island? Can we just take a little trip out to Nijima Police Department? Hideyoshi, that would be impossible with this weather. At the very least, we can't do anything until the typhoon passes us by. Krause's boat is being repaired and is not on the island. Therefore, we must wait for the boat coming on Monday. How could this happen? Six people are dead! The phones and radio aren't working and there's no boat! So until the typhoon passes and the boat comes, in other words, until tomorrow morning, we're gonna be stuck here on this island unable to contact the police, aren't we? Which means that not just us, but the criminal who killed everyone is also confined to this island. That certainly follows. The culprit who killed everyone is still here on this island. So that bastard who killed Dad and the others must still be hiding somewhere, unable to escape. Damn it. Damn it, damn it, damn it! I'll catch that bastard! No way I'll hand the motor to the police! I'll slice him the bitch myself! Oh, fuck. Maria finally realized that something odd was happening in the parlor. Rather than noticing something odd, it was probably better to say she felt unhappy and neglected since everyone was getting so excited about something only she didn't know about. <laughs> Jessica! <laughs> did someone die? Wow, okay. This bitch creepy as fuck, I'm not gonna lie. The way she spoke was completely calm. Just as though she was talking about someone who appeared on a television drama, as though it was someone else's problem. Jessica probably didn't like that. As though trying to say, can't you tell just by looking at me? Overwhelmed with grief? She flared up at Maria. They all died! Everyone! Everyone! My dad and Battler's parents! Gota and Shana! And even your mother too! Stop it, Jessica! You aren't the only one who's sad! Maria... I know this will come as a shock, but please listen. Your mother... has died. Mama died? Damn, that's tough. Sucks to suck, my nigga. Yeah, someone killed her. I know it's sad, but stay strong. How many people died? Six! Six people! Damn it, damn it, damn it! How could anyone do something that cruel? There's a limit to how cruel you can be if you're a human. I don't know who it is, but the culprit isn't human! There's no way their blood is red! Oh, she's about to say some creepy shit. The culprit isn't human. It's the blank chosen by the blank. Huh? Hey, Maria. Did you say something just now? Maria just said something. But since her words were so remotely separated from the flow and context of the conversation, I couldn't quite understand them for a second. When I tried asking her to repeat it again, I was shocked by the sudden sound of Aunt Natsui's loud voice coming from the entrance of the parlor. It looked like Aunt Natsui and Aunt Ava had returned from their trip to see Grandfather. You can't contact them even with the radio. If we can't use it at a time like this, why do we even have an emergency radio? My apologies. It was supposed to have a maintenance inspection every year. Wait, don't you have one of those boat signaling devices that makes a flashing light? Couldn't you use that to contact the next island? We do not have such equipment. My sincere apologies. Just then, Kumasawa arrived, pushing a serving cart loaded with breakfast. Since there's no way we'd be able to eat in a dining hall, Hideyoshi ordered her to take it to the parlor. Why are we eating breakfast here? Uh, Natsuhi. Natsuhi, I'll tell you later. More importantly, Ava, how was father? Judging by the fact that he is not with you, 
It seems he will not leave his room, not even for a situation like this. He wasn't there. The room was empty. Nani? The fuck? What? What? What the? Where could he have gone at a time like this? Do you mean to say the master has left the study? That is correct. I was surprised myself. I wonder where he left his room. I wonder when he left his room. Do any of you have an idea? Natsui looked at Genji and Kanan as she said this. Maybe she was trying to ask whether the servants who had served directly under the one-winged angel knew of a place he might go. However, it was probably the other way around. Their faces made it clear that those who knew Kenzo best realized even more the, than the rest how impossible it was for him to leave his room. Even we have no idea. As you all know, within that study, the master had everything from a place to sleep to a bathroom. I couldn't imagine him leaving that room except for a significant reason. In that case, what? Isn't it natural to assume that one of those significant reasons came up? We still cannot be certain that's the case. Anyway, he is a fickle person, so it's possible he went for a walk by himself unaware of the current situation. If that is the case, then we must act in all haste to tell him what has happened and ask for instructions. That's right. Although I don't want to think about it, it's possible something has happened to him, isn't it? I'd rather not consider such a sinister possibility. No one had seen Kenzo since the discovery of those six terrible corpses. On top of that, the phones were broken, the radio wouldn't reach anyone, and there was no way to contact the police. Apparently, the typhoon would leave tomorrow, and a boat would come. But until then, no one could rely on anyone outside the island, nor could they escape the island. The tragedy had hit everyone so abruptly that they lost all their composure. Everyone felt a heavy silence, everyone was impatient. Even though they needed to do something, they couldn't think of anything. So some of them held their hands, heads in their, hand, in their arms while others got irritated. Right now, no one could explain what was occurring on this island, Rock and Jima. And then the witch appeared and started shooting people with an AK-47. After that, we ate, we ate the breakfast Kumasawa had made, which felt dry and tasteless. Of course, this was right after something like that happened. No one felt particularly hungry. However, we understood logically that not eating would weaken our bodies. It would also be rude to Kumasawa who had made the breakfast. Kumasawa had taken some unusual Western vegetables one that Goda had probably ordered for his ultra-elaborate meals and cooked them in a Japanese style, which made them turn an unpleasant color. As to what Goda had been planning to cook with these ingredients, right then I couldn't even imagine it. If I did have to think about it, I'd be reminded of the way Goda died. Fuck. Yeah, we don't know where the hell this guy is. If I did think about it, I'd be reminded of the way Goda died, and a sour taste would fill the inside of my mouth. Everyone pretended to eat for the time being, but of course, no one made much progress. Then we began pooling our knowledge of the current situation. First off, six people, which included Uncle Krause, my dad, Kyrie, Aunt Rosa, Goda and Shannon have been found in the Rose Garden storehouse's brutally mutilated corpses. And yet we still couldn't contact the police since both the phones and the radio were unusable. So until the typhoon passed, there was nothing we could do. Furthermore, Grandfather, who we might have hoped would be able to show a little leadership in this kind of situation, had disappeared some time ago. Goda hadn't made breakfast, so Grandfather's stomach must have been empty. And if he came and if he had just been taking a casual walk, we should have been able to hear him whining about how hungry he was by now. And despite that, he hadn't appeared. There was more than a small chance that he'd gotten caught up in this crime. 
According to my aunts, on the way back from Kenzo's study, they searched for him, calling out on every floor, but were unable to find him. Considering the timing of all things, considering the timing of it all, it's only reasonable to assume that this disappearing has something to do with the crime. We figured Dad and the rest were probably killed in the dining hall, then painstakingly moved to the storehouse. So maybe Grandfather has already been killed and dragged to some strange place which we simply haven't discovered yet. No one actually said it out loud, but this theory seemed extremely convincing. We will go check all of the windows and we will go check that all the windows and doors are locked. We must also contact a thorough search for father. The children must remain in this room. Eva and Hideyoshi, I'm sorry, but please stay here with the children. I'd like to ask the same of you, Dr. Nanjo. I understand. I will wait here. And not to be followed the servants, Genji and Kumasawa and Kana out of the parlor. All that was left was Aunt Ava, Uncle Hideyoshi, Dr. Nanjo, and the four of us children. A total of seven people. Let's all stick together and maybe watch some television while we wait. Though I doubt we'll find anything good in the middle of the day on a Sunday. Uncle Hideyoshi started acting cheerfully, trying to brighten up this gloomy atmosphere. Good show, watch it, watch it. Oh, really? You want to watch TV, Mario? Then come watch with it with your uncle. Mario was the only one who joined in. Even though Mario had been told of her mother's death, she didn't show the slightest flicker in her emotions. Was it really normal for a nine-year-old girl like Mario to act so much like a very young child? Everyone else's mood failed to improve, and they each sank absent-mindedly into their sofas. Can I ask you something? What is it? Just now in the storehouse. You said something about Shannon in a ring. Did you give that to her? George didn't answer, but he hung his head and closed both of his eyes. There could be no clearer response. Wait a battler. Figure it out yourself. You're right. I shouldn't have asked. That's right. It was me. Last night, I proposed to her. That was when I gave her the ring. I told her that tomorrow, she should put it on whichever finger she wanted, as her answer. Guess it was a pretty pretentious thing to say. And that ring had been on the ring finger of Shannon's left hand. Well, several years ago, Shannon came to me asking for advice about you, George. I wonder what she could have asked. Shannon was always really bad at lying. It was pretty, it was pretty, uh, it was obvious pretty quickly that you were the one she was talking about. She asked whether it'd be okay for her to get close to someone, even though she was only a servant. She asked about what kind of things boys like, what kind of clothes she should wear to make them happy. Lots of stuff like that. Well, I guess you could say I felt envious hearing her say that. Hot as fuck. So then she was given an engagement ring. And it all ended right there. Different people value things differently. But being proposed to by a man, well, it can be the high point of your life. So I'm sure, last night, I'm sure Shannon was happy. From the bottom of her heart. Happier than she'd ever been since the day of her birth. George sighed deeply without raising his head. Or maybe tears had risen to his eyes. It seems Shannon was on duty in the guest house last night. But because she was too embarrassed to go back to the guest house with me, she went over to the mansion. Think about how Shannon must have felt when you receive an engagement ring that no matter how much warning you've been given beforehand, it's perfectly normal to get so excited that your mind goes blank. She must have been incredibly embarrassed. 
And then Shannon went to the mansion even though she hadn't been assigned there. Helped Goto with his work and got caught up in this crime. If only I hadn't given her that ring on that day, in that place, Shannon wouldn't have... Sayo wouldn't have been caught up in that crime. That's the one place where you're wrong. It's definitely wrong. So don't cry anymore. Damn. Battling. Let's leave him be. After Aunt Ava said that I stopped talking to him. This place words of comfort might actually do more harm than good. Jessica sat down next to Aniki and put an arm around him. Maybe only Jessica, who had known about Aniki and Shannon's love since the beginning, and who had even discussed our relationship with Shannon, could comfort him now. I went over to Aunt Ava and sat down on the opposite sofa. Battler, you really are strong. It looks like you've kept a good hold on yourself. Uh, well... Look, the depth of love becomes the depth of a wound, right? After all, it's not like how that old bastard died has anything to do with me. I feel bad about Kyrie, but, well, she wasn't actually my parent. My, my. If that's so, you certainly were... If that's so, you certainly were crying a lot back then. Well, I did think at least that much crying was due as gratitude to the parents who raised me. <laughs> The speed of that changeover and that dry tone must have come from Rudolph. That kid would always get violently happy, sad, and angry. But he'd always regain his cool immediately afterwards. Nothing like that. I haven't really been able to get over the shock yet. I think the only difference between me and everyone else is the kinds of emotion stirred in me. What do you mean? I've been acting much calmer than George and Jessica. That wasn't because my sadness was any less intense or because I'd already recovered. My sadness was simply getting replaced gradually with a different emotion. Rather than sad, I'd say I'm more pissed the fuck off. What bastard did this and where? It's kind of been eating at me that I didn't get a chance to smack the fuck out of him. That was what I really wanted to do. I couldn't forgive myself, I just sat there, overwhelmed with sadness and hugging my knees. Since the time Dad and the others were killed, this island has been covered by a typhoon, which means the bastard responsible for all of this is still somewhere on this island. Yes, that would be the case. I wonder if they're hiding somewhere in that dark forest even now. I felt like I had a very similar conversation with Kyrie the night before. That's right. After the letter from the person claiming to be Beatrice appeared at the dinner table last night, we talked about whether or not the 19th person actually exists. Aneva, do you think this murder has anything to do with the letter from Beatrice last night? Ah, that one. Well, I wonder. All of the siblings agreed that the mysterious letter was sent to further complicate the problem of father's inheritance. As to whether that and the case this morning are related, it's impossible to tell at this stage. Was that letter really given to Maria by some witch called Beatrice? How could it be? All of it was a farce devised by father, wasn't it? He made shine on there someone wear a dress from the portrait and trick Maria, right? Isn't it just a kind of overly intricate prank father would pull? Last night, I talked with Beatrice about whether Be I talked with Kyrie about whether Beatrice actually exists. And Kyrie also said that Beatrice was probably one of us eight one of the eighteen of us. Isn't that obvious? There's no one else on this island besides us, right? Then there must be someone amongst us who's pretending to be Beatrice. There's no one else but us on the island. 
You think? Obviously, right? Are you saying there could be someone else here other than us? No one is on this island except us. There are only 18 people. So the one pretending to be Beatrice has to be one of those 18. Kiryu denied the existence of a 19th person by spinning the chessboard around. Even though Aunt Ava had it constructed an argument that complicated, her opinion at least was the same. Except if that was the case, our situation starts to look very ugly. At the time of Beatrice's letter, the whole thing could be passed off as a prank set up by someone or another. However, if we're assuming there's no 19th person, we can't ignore this anymore. In other words, if there's no 19th person, and the culprit who killed Dad and the others is also one of us 18. So in the other words, the person who killed them killed them is one of the people inside this very mansion right now. Aunt Ava smiled meaningfully. It looked like she thought this conclusion should have been obvious from the very beginning. The culprit carried the bodies of those six into the storehouse. But even that is an impressive feat, don't you think? That shutter is always closed and locked, right? In other words, in order to carry them into the storehouse, the culprit would need to unlock the shutter. Understand? Is it possible the shutter was left open by mistake that day? The servant said it's always kept locked. In other words, unless the culprit took the keys from the servant room, there's no way they could have opened the storehouse. I wonder if the key in the servant room was the only one. Genji said that was the case. Which means the culprit knew where the single key was kept and took it. Just now, I watched when Kanan returned with the key return the key to the servant room. The wall was packed with keys, so I don't think a novice would know where or what to those keys went to. The culprit was miraculously able to find the storehouse key among all of those. Furthermore, even though the key didn't have a tag or anything sticking to it, they knew it was the key to the storehouse behind the rose garden. And that means they also knew what the storehouse was. I'll say it even clearer. The culprit knew the inside of the servant room well. Her argument was extremely plain and clear. If the bodies had been found thrown somewhere in the bushes of the rose garden, there wouldn't be much to go on. However, if there was only one key to the storehouse in the servant room, and it was stored in such a large group of keys, a novice would not be able to tell them apart. This means the culprit was someone who went into the servant room a lot and was familiar with the locations of the keys. The family member didn't normally go into the servant room, which meant that... Which means... One of the servants is... The culprit. I'm sorry, but even I can't tell you any more than that. However, I'll tell you one thing. What's that? It's reasonable to think that the culprit... No, culprits are multiple in number, and fairly well armed. They'd have to be, wouldn't they? They had to assault the four in the dining hall and kill them, drag a total of six bodies all the way to the storehouse beyond the rose garden, and arrange for that disgusting makeup and the graffiti on the shutter. There's no way that a single cobra could carry out all of that on their own, right? It made sense. It probably would have been possible for a single person with enough time but it would take so incredibly long. It was probably safe to assume that a significant number of people were involved. So what you're saying is that maybe all of the servants were in cahoots. Please, keep quiet, okay? It wouldn't be right to voice mere speculation like this. And if it really is true, what would you do next? They might not let us leave here alive. This is an opponent who had no trouble killing Nissan and three others. Right now, the only ones I can count on to fight with me are the three in my family and maybe you. Which comes to a total of four people, right? We're no better off than they were last night. In short, it'd be easy for the culprits to massacre the rest of us. 
I've been playing detective with Aunt Ava, trying to expose the person who had killed Dad and the rest before the police did. If only I could clearly penetrate the culprit's identity and stick the proof in their face. I'd been so sure. Just like one of those detective movies, the culprit would then give up and surrender. However, the culprit would only surrender if there was no way for them to fight back. The culprit behind the culprits behind the crime on this island were far from helpless. They might even be able to massacre all of the remaining people here. And on top of that, this island was like a giant closed room, cut off from the outside world by the typhoon. So they had a full day until tomorrow to kill, scheme, and camouflage themselves. In short, it wasn't a safe atmosphere where we could get very far by playing detective. To the contrary, we were at a stage where we had to be scared stiff, since playing detective might displease the culprits and cause them to commit another mass murder. Well, it is just a possibility, right? But I can't bring myself to trust those servants yet. And that doesn't mean I only suspect them. Don't you think there might be some mastermind behind all this? A mastermind? Why do you say that? It's just a feeling. Think about the word servant. Think about what the word servant literally means. It means someone who serves at someone else's arms and legs, right? It was a bunch of Ushiramiya family members who got killed. So naturally, there must be someone who stands to gain from that result. This was also plain and clear. The Ushiramiya family had been right in the middle of discussion about how to distrib distribute the inheritance when grandfather died. But this case followed the standard form of any classic mystery novel. The crime was definitely caused by someone with ties with the Ushiramiya family and who was involved in the inheritance problem. Aunt Eva had probably read a few books in that genre herself. Her argument may have been a few blind assumptions in it. May have had a few blind assumptions in it, but it was a standard conclusion that anyone might have reached. I think most people would end up suspecting the servants, even if they used different reasonings to get there. Especially the story about the key to the shutter. That made it very easy to suspect one, suspect one of the servants was involved. And that's why... I don't like it. What do you mean you don't like it? Nah, just talking to myself. I tried to dodge her question by joking, but I couldn't erase the sense of unease welling up inside me. After all, her conclusion was such an easy one to reach. A conclusion that anyone could reach. And I just couldn't be satisfied with that. If I tried spinning the chessboard around like I learned from Kyrie, this was exactly why a servant couldn't possibly be the culprit. If the servants really were the culprits, they wouldn't hide the dead bodies in a place connected to themselves. Why on earth would they use the Rose Garden Shed if they were the ones in charge of the key that could unlock it? The police would probably immediately pursue whoever had been in control of the key. It was even possible that some other fact, facts might come to light because of the result, as a result. The more we think about the servants as the culprits, the less reason they had to carry the bodies into the storehouse. But what if they knew we think that? and put the corpses in the storehouse for that very reason. No, that's impossible. When the police come and inspect the scene of the crime, they'll probably be able to uncover many things. No matter how carefully the culprits carried out that murder, some traces will definitely be found. In other words, they had everything to lose and nothing to gain. If you think about it this way and look at the murder gain from the culprit side, it's hard to imagine why they want to call attention to the corpses. Once the corpses were found, it could result in someone sending a report to the police, or it could make the remaining people fuck, make the remaining people more cautious, or it might make the survivors start to search for the culprit. None of these things would make life any easier for the culprit. It's just like the words of the main characters of the... It's just like the words of the main character's mother in a novel I read recently called He- I get the reference too. Cause I remember, I think it was in Higurashi spoilers by the way. Higurashi spoilers, if you haven't seen Higurashi, this is spoilers right now.
I think it was in um what's it called? The Sadako arc. When Keichi was planning on killing Sadako's uncle, he asked his he asked his mom about mystery novels and she told him some um some similar shit, I think. So I get the reference, but like, bro, dead ass. This is not the time for a fucking Higurashi reference. Nigga trying to promote his shit. Every story needs to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. Eliminating the beginning is essential for the perfect crime. Yeah, that's what she said. I remember that. Right now, we don't see where grandfather is. We don't know if he's already become a victim or if he's one of the culprits. But this state of confusion must be beneficial to the killer. The culprit has absolutely nothing to gain by showing us the bodies in such an obvious way and making us realize there's been a killer, a murder. In fact, this was the perfect place to spin the chessboard around. In other words, showing us the corpses in such a flashy way must be the culprit's goal in and of itself. So at the very least to the culprit, the appearance of six corpses there meant more than the death itself. The deaths themselves. In other words, the culprit wanted this murder on display. To whom? To us. This is a message. The culprit's trying to shove something in our faces. I don't know what it is. At this point in time, this vulgar mass murder isn't making me feel anything except the malice directed towards all of us. Malice towards all of us. Is it? Each one of the survivors has some kind of connection to one of the six victims. Uncle Krause's death brought Jessica grief, the grief of losing a family member. The deaths of Dad and Kyrie brought me sorrow, while Aunt Rosa's death brought Maria sorrow. Did it though? Goda's death probably shocked his fellow servants, and Shannon's death brought grief both to George, who had proposed to her, and Kanan, who loved her like an older sister. Everyone now on this island has received an equal amount of sadness. Aunt Ava was sure that the servants were in cahoots. But then, how could you explain the deaths of Goda and Shana? At any rate, by this argument, the grief caused by the six deaths hit everyone but Uncle Ava and Uncle Aunt Ava and Uncle Hideyoshi. Even Aunt Ava, who had directed suspicion at the servants and acted as though she herself was beyond suspicion could not be ruled out as a suspect. In the first place, she was able to argue that the servants were suspicious by focusing on the shutter's key. But if you look at it from the perspective of, when you look at it from the perspective of motive and who would gain, Aunt Ava's name rises to the top of the list. I know what you're thinking, battling. Huh? <laughs> oh no. Please, don't tell anybody. About how my head's so full of obscene stuff. I'm the one who's gonna gain the most from these murders. Since I'm gonna be suspected anyway, I might as well get it out in the open. I tried to dodge the issue by joking around, but apparently it didn't work. The inheritance will be divided into as many parts as there are siblings. But right now, I'm the only one of the four left. All of the assets of the Ashura Mia family will become mine. If Uncle Hideyoshi heard you, he'd say, Could you give it a rest? It's not funny. I'm sorry. I was just fooling around. Since I'm going to be suspected anyway, no matter how I try to smooth it over. That's why, from my point of view, this murder might have been designed to cast suspicion on me. Unfortunately, my alibi for last night is weak. Could you tell me a bit more about last night? As you know, the discussion between the siblings of how to sl as you know, the discussion between the siblings of how to slice up and eat the inheritance continued until late in the night. But I don't know how late it lasted. My husband and I woken up early that morning. We were so sleepy and, it, and a little past midnight they let us go. We then returned to the guest house and rested there. Can anyone other than Uncle Hideyoshi prove that? 
No, wait. It's not like I suspect you or anything, okay? Oh, are you sure about that? I don't know if it counts as proof, but when we returned to the guest house, we were greeted by Genji who asked if we needed a towel. I think that should be enough to prove we returned to the guest house a little after midnight. Though, if my theory was correct, the servants would all be in cahoots, and that wouldn't make for much of an alibi. Hey, you've got a point there. Guess that means I'm playing detective with the real culprit right now, huh? <laughs> However, let me say this for my honor's sake. If I was after the inheritance, I'd never commit such a bizarre set of murders. After all, if I just wanted them to forfeit their rights to the inheritance, it wouldn't matter to me how they die. It'd be much smarter for me to try to make their death look like an accident. Especially if you're assuming I laid out some careful plan that involved even the servants. You've got a point there. If you're killing someone for personal gain, you definitely shouldn't make it look like a murder. Exactly. That's why I'm in such a blue mood. The police will probably treat me like the mastermind and investigate all kinds of things. Not fun at all. Aunt Ava shrugged with a bitter smile. It was easy to suspect Aunt Ava as it was to suspect the servants. So if we spin the chessboard around, does that make it impossible for the culprit to be her? Suspicious as she is? However, if that sort of argument always works, then motive then motive can never help us in any way. No, that can't be right. Knowing the motive must give us powerful clues towards knowing the culprit. That's why murderer that's why murderers from all time periods despise crimes in complicated ways, clearly preventing their motives from being discovered. I don't get it. Just don't get it. Every time I spin the chessboard around, it keeps flipping the front to back and back to front. Are my thoughts bringing me closer to the truth? Or are they... Aunt Ava didn't want to talk any more than that, so I folded my arms and headed toward, headed to the window to cool my head a little. As I looked over the parlor, I saw George and the others gathered, talking. It looked like they were talking about the magic circle that had been painted onto the shutter. As Uncle Hideyoshi thought back to that time, I started drawing the shape in the margins of Mario's notebook. I see, since Mario was second only to grandfather in knowledge of the occult, she might understand what it meant. Uh, I think it was probably something like that. There was a mark that looked like a variation of a cross. And then surrounding the circle around uh, all around the perimeter were those deeply, were those closely packed strange letters on all four sides of the cross. And the four corners, there was something written. It didn't look like the alphabet or something like that. It was what they call ancient characters. And around the top of the circumference, there was a small mark. Five small circles arranged in a plus sign, and straight lines connecting them. Ah, uh, yeah, there was definitely something like that drawn there. Yeah, there's no mistake in the shape. I don't understand the thin characters, but the arrangement was nearly the same. Everyone was staring down at the shape, so I stared down at it too. From what I heard, this had been painted on the shutter of the storehouse with some material that looked like blood. I see. The sure is unsettling. Grandfather's probably the only one who'd want to draw something this weird. Seriously, where did he go? I want to grab him and ask him what the hell this is supposed to mean. Jessica's voice contained impatience and anger. She hadn't gone as far to say Grandfather was the culprit, but she seemed sure that... Grandfather knew something about the culprit's background. Of course, if you were searching for a link connecting the Oshira Mia family to the occult, 10 out of 10 people would think of Grandfather. Also, to a person who knew nothing of the occult, this strange mark would have no meaning, which means that this might have been something addressed to Grandfather. That's right. And the reason the crime was shown to the survivors was so they'd find this. In that case, why had Grandfather the essential recipient of this message disappeared off to. Does this shape ring any bells? 
Mario looked at the ship with a serious face. Maybe she was enthusiastic because this was her area of expertise. However, her appearance was that of someone separated from the events at hand. As though this thing hadn't been drawn on a shutter closed. As though this thing hadn't been drawn on a shutter closed around her mother's corpse. My first impression was that the design resembled a German cross. It certainly does have that kind of design. Does that mean it has something to do with Germany? The German cross was originally a crest from a religious order of knights and was supposed to protect pilgrims traveling to sacred places. So in other words, this magic circle might have some religious meaning? This is starting to sound like gibberish. When I looked over at all of them preparing to jump in on a discussion, something shocked me. Maria was smiling, an eerie and incomprehensible expression on her face. It was almost as if she was making fun of everyone's ignorance. It was like an expression I wouldn't have dreamed to find on Maria's face. And she laughed. That eerie, jarring laugh was something I didn't want to believe was possible, even though I was looking at it right in front of my eyes. Maria, what the fuck is wrong with you? This bitch crazy. Oh, shit! Fuck this game! Why is this shit lagging like this? Why is this shit fucking lagging like this? See now, if they just changed the picture like normal, instead of having a dumbass delay, that wouldn't have scared the shit out of me. It's fucking goofy ass music, bro. You people aren't even close. Can't you tell just by looking? <laughs> While everyone was busy being scared out of their wits, Maria kept on cackling happily to herself. After a while, that laugh was suddenly and abruptly cut off. But her expression still looked like it belonged to someone completely different from Maria. This is the seventh magic circle of the sun. These characters are written in Hebrew. Give it here. Uh... Sure. Maria stole the writing materials from the stunned Hideyoshi's hand, and then started drawing another magic circle with the rustle right next to the one Hideyoshi had drawn. See? It looks sort of like this, right? Yes. It was. Maria, incredible. You really do know a lot. Jessica tried to smooth things over by praising Maria. Maybe she wanted to confirm that this was still the Mario we all knew so well. But Maria didn't answer her in any particular way. Maria began swiftly writing unfamiliar characters in the corners of the shapes. When Uncle Hideyoshi and Dr. Nanjo saw them, their eyes immediately began to open wide. Written on the top and the bottom and the left and the right are the names of the angels who preside over the wind, fire, earth, and water. Chasan, Ero, Forlock, and Talihad. And in the four corners are the names of the four great kings. Ariel, Seraph, Tharshis, and Cherub. Is that what you saw? Even though they hadn't been able to correctly write what they'd seen, when they were once again shown something identical, it wasn't difficult for them to realize the two were the same. When Maria asked them whatever, whether it matched, Uncle Hideyoshi and Dr. Nanjo nodded over and over again. There's no mistake, that's it. I'm sure there were characters that looked like that. How were you able to write something like that? There were also characters written around the circumference. I know. Like this, right? Mario quickly began to surround the circumference with more Hebrew writing. It's from Psalms of the Old Testament, the 16th and 17th verses in the and the 116th Psalm. You must have at least read the Bible, right? <laughs> Acting as though knowing this was only common knowledge, Maria laughed. For a while, everyone including me was at a loss for words. 
A little later, George returned to his senses and slowly managed to speak. That's incredible. I'm surprised. So, what meaning does this magic circle have? It's a magic circle to borrow the power of the sun. He who wears it as a talisman drawn in gold shall be able to break free from the bonds of any prison and receive the power to gain freedom. To break free from bonds and gain freedom. It sounds deep. The word bond is not limited in its interpretation to some kind of physical object. Therefore, it does not only hold meaning for people locked up in an actual jail. It can also refer to the release from mental bonds with its ties of obligation and escapable, inescapable faith. Ties of obligation and inescapable fate, you say? That's also pretty deep. But I really don't understand. What does this have to do with those six bodies? Far from being released, they were killed and stuffed in a storehouse, weren't they? It's not like the magic circle was drawn for their sakes. The six of them were there for the sake of the magic circle. It is truly pitiable. What do you mean? What in the world do you mean when you said the six of them were there for the sake of the magic circle? Maria lifted her pointer finger and wigg waggled it as if she were making fun of us. That's written around the circumference. Can't you read it? Dumb fuck. Psalms chapter 116, verses 16 and 17. I'll read it for you. The Lord has freed me from my chain. I will offer to you the sacrifice of thanksgiving and will call on the name of the Lord. See? See, you say. I've got no idea what you're talking about. They were used as sacrifices to power the magic circle. You're saying they're human sacrifices. If what Maria had just read aloud was a vital part of the magic circle, then, say, then it was saying that sacrifices had to be offered in order for this magic circle to be effective. Remember in the epitaph! They were the, the the people were sacrifices to re to bring back the witch, bro. Y'all better start believing this shit. So human sacrifices have been offered inside the storehouse where the magic circle had been drawn. A heartbeat later, everyone else seemed to reach the same conclusion. Some people were shocked, others spat out that that this was insane as they punched their knees. It was starting to get incredibly disturbing. We couldn't accept or understand it. I don't care what kind of magic circles or curses other people believe in. I won't pick a fight with them. But did they really kill dad and the rest as sacrifices for crap like that? I just couldn't stand that feeling. Compared to this, I preferred it when we were so disgusted by that theory about the fight over the inheritance. I started getting pissed off with the feeling between anger and sadness. I broke from the circle everyone was in and returned once again to the window. Something had gone insane since yesterday. There was that letter from the witch, Beatrice, that Maria had read aloud at last night's dinner. Ever since then, it feels like we've... No, like this whole mansion and this whole island has been getting more and more firmly locked inside some kind of bizarre world. That's right. When I think back on it, that, was, that letter was an invitation from the witch. The ruler of the nighttime island had invited us inhabitants on the of the day of the day into another world. The phone and the radio had been interrupted and the island was shut off by a typhoon. So you really could call this place another world cut off from the real one by now. Yeah, as this island is now, it's perfectly normal for a wish to send us letters and for human sacrifices to be offered up for the sake of magic circles. So what will happen next? Will some weird people wearing goat masks start doing the Bond Festival dance or something? It's hopeless, it's hopeless, I don't get it. The inside of my head's all screwed up and I don't even know what to think. Anger, sadness, the opposing emotions all swirled up together and they suck, they suck me in. Unable to resist, I could do nothing but cover my eyes with my hands and trust in my mind and body as I started getting sucked in.
As I started losing heart, I began to recall a memory from when I was small. It was from when I was very young. I had unfortunately seen a scary occult movie on TV, and for a while I hadn't been able to go to the bathroom by myself. That old bastard gave me an exaggerated laugh and said this. Hey, battling. Why do you think they go through all the trouble to make movies like this about demons and the occult and such? It's because they don't exist. Something that ridiculous can't be found anywhere on the planet. Because they don't exist, people want to see them and go to a lot of effort making them. That's why those occult movies just make me laugh. If I were forced to choose, I say rather demons and monsters. This year's earnings call, this year earnings call and angry wives are a hundred million times scarier. I'll go further, okay? From my point of view, getting scared is a recreational emotion, something for people who've got room to relax both in their hearts and their lifestyles. They had, they had so much free time they didn't know what to do with it. So in order to entertain their mind with the unusual emotions, people started creating a culture with demons and the occult and stuff. Low-key hard as fuck. Seriously, why have I been acting so damn thick-headed? I was totally taken in. Don't try to mess with me. This is a human world, nigga. I don't give a damn about no witches, demons, magic circles, and sacrifices. The, the human who killed dad and everyone else still on this island. That's all there is to it, right? The next person who started speaking in my heart was Kyrie. You see, in both chess and shogi, when you reach the very, very last stage of the game and get closer and closer to cornering your opponent, the number of optimal moves you could possibly make gets smaller and smaller. That's why, I mean, therefore, if you're backing someone against a wall, or if someone's doing the same to you, both players become infinitely easier to read. In other words, when you're completely cornered and you think you have no moves left, that is when the opponent is the easiest to, that's when, that is the moment when it's easiest to read your opponent. However, when a person is forced into a defensive position, they can't help but lose their ability to think clearly, so they aren't able to get their minds around their opponent's moves. That's when you spin the chessboard around. With all my strength, I slapped my face with both hands. Now my eyes were truly open. When you don't understand something and you're completely cornered like I am now, isn't that the perfect time to spin the chessboard around? While on the defensive, we can't even guess at the corporate scheme. If we spin it around and look at it that way, just what might we see? First off, at the time the corporate committed the murders, they knew the island was being cut off by a typhoon. Therefore, they should have understood that even if they carried out the murders, they wouldn't be able to get away early the next morning. In short, the culprit had begun without securing a way to escape. Furthermore, that bastard talks the corpses into the storehouse. Then was even kind enough to say, here they are, with a weird bit of graffiti. In other words, since, he, since we'd probably find the corpses sooner or later, they wanted to show them to us. If we'd all been dim and hadn't, hadn't noticed the storage shed, the culprit's goal would not have been achieved, would it? <laughs> if you think about it that way, that bastard of a culprit. Since this morning, they must have been watching her every move with bated breath. After all, if we hadn't been so kind as to discover what was on the storehouse, all of that hard work and preparation they did last night would have just gone poof. What did the culprit make us want? What did the culprit want to make us feel by showing us the corpses in the storehouse? All six of the bodies had their faces noticeably destroyed. Was it a grudge? A warning? The defacement of the bodies had occurred after death, so it had to have been a means by which the culprit had killed. It didn't mean anything to those who had been killed. It did have meaning to those who found the bodies. The culprit wanted to make it appear that they had been killed so brutally. Ha! After thinking this way, I really want to tell that bastard to stop taking me so lightly. Who, who just danced to that tune? If you're told, please be scared, 
You can't just say, really? <laughs> sure thing. When someone tells the great Ushiro Miya battler, the entrance is right here. I'm the kind of guy who start wanting to sneak in through the window. Break and enter, bitch. The next thing that had me concerned was that so-called magic circle on the shutter. As Maria, who had shown that her knowledge of the occult rival grandfathers had recognized, that magic circle was genuine. They must have drawn that thing in pitch black darkness, taking a lot of time and holding an umbrella in one hand. Isn't that amount of hard work and perfectionism impressive? What purpose would have been worth all that effort? If we were looking for a fan of the occult in this mansion, most likely all of us would naturally suspect Grandfather. Did they want to make us think Grandfather was involved? But if that's all they wanted, they could have just drawn in the old scribble that looked like a magic circle. It wasn't a it wasn't like any of us amateurs would be able to tell the difference between genuine and fake. However, this magic circle was genuine, and furthermore had been even written in Hebrew. So this magic circle had a message that could only be understood by someone with knowledge of the occult. A message is a form of communication. By sending it, they were hoping for a reaction. A reaction. For some reason, we couldn't find Grandfather now. I don't know how Grandfather might have spotted the magic circle on the shutter, but did he choose to hide himself in reaction to that? No. Was it a trap to make us suspect that Grandfather had participated? You could read it either way. Damn, that's annoying. What kind of reaction was this corporate hoping to get out of us by putting on this occult show? Somehow, that felt like the corporate's weak point. The letter from Beatrice that Mar Maria had read aloud during last night's dinner sprang back into my mind. This was a freak who'd asked us to enjoy a battle of wits. Isn't that interesting? This is a battle of wits between us and the witch. Will we be sucked up by her occult game first? Or will we pull off her fake skin? There's a whole day until the typhoon passes. Why not enjoy ourselves? Well, shit. That boy Battler a little confident, isn't he? I finally noticed that the inside of the parlor had gone quiet again. Everyone had sunk into their favorite sofa, some deep in thought, some irritated and some acting depressed. Maria was once again enjoying the TV as if she'd never left it. Looked like she found, uh, found the commercials more fun than the boring program, and she happily yelled, ooh, ooh, and giggled. I stared at each person's appearance in turn. If there's a, not, if it isn't a 19th person, then the culprit must be in this room. It was Maria. Maria did it! She killed them all! Right now, Aunt Natsuhi is searching the mansion with the servants, right? And we shouldn't say in this room. And this mansion is where the culprit has to be. After all, it's possible Aunt Natsuhi was behind this. And we still can't deny that one of the servants might be the killer. Anyone could be guilty. Still, Unnatsuhi and the rest are taking their time. Of course, it's not a small mansion, but isn't this taking a too little? Isn't this taking a little too long just to walk around, checking the windows and doors? I was about to say, if, if we find, uh, don't don't kill Natsuhi, I'll flip the fuck out. Just as I was thinking this, Unnatsuhi and the rest returned. Not one of them was missing, but our relief was short lived. Everyone looked at Aunt Natsuhi in shock. The talk I'd had with Aunt Ava started to creep back into my mind. The possibility that the culprits had enough in numbers or weapons to kill all six of those people at once. She got a blinky! Forgive me if I startled you all. I brought this to be prepared for the worst. After all, that thing in Aunt Natsuhi's hand was a fucking rifle. At first glance, its silhouette looked like a lot like a hunting gun, but it was unusually short and kind of looked like a kid-sized weapon. 
However, it had a weightiness to it that made it clear it was no kid's toy. That gun is Kinzo's, isn't it? Did you know about it? That's right. I remember it was in father's old collection and I managed to find it. Whoa! Awesome. Natsui, is that thing real? Yes, it's real. It can fire live ammunition. Long ago, father used it to scare away wild birds. Ah, uh, that takes me back. Where did you find that thing? No matter how much I asked him to let me touch it, he never let me lay even one finger on it. Oh, grandfather had one of these? I didn't know that. Long ago, grandfather was actually addicted to cowboy films. That generation really liked this kind of rifle. Is that a Winchester? But I've never seen one that short before. Ah! I remember, it's that gun! That really takes me back. That's the one Stream McQueen fired off and wanted alive or dead. Father sure has good taste. It is an item the Master ordered specially from America long ago. As you can see, it is a working gun. So please, don't tell anyone about this. He was quite fond of it right after he managed to acquire it. It seems the workings that ejected the cartridges were more interesting to him than shooting it. And he played around with it back in the forest all the time. Still, it's rather disturbing. Are you sure you should be dragging this out? This is to prepare for the worst. There was probably even more than one offender involved. Furthermore, those horrible people killed six of us, including my husband. I have a responsibility to protect everyone until tomorrow, in my husband's place. As Natsui said this, she slumped down into one of the sofas and took a deep breath. She had been trying to find Grandfather as well as check the doors and windows. Since Grandfather wasn't with her, she probably still didn't know where, she, where he was. I carefully checked all the doors and windows throughout the mansion. However, we must be prepared for anything. Everyone, I think it would be best if we all remained here. Oh, good point. If everyone's gathered here, then we can all feel more secure by keeping an eye on each other. What do you mean by that, Ava? <laughs> Nothing, really. I'm just agreeing with your opinion, aren't I? There was a stormy atmosphere between the two of them. If you think about who the most suspicious from the inheritance standpoint, Aunt Ava was the obvious answer. However, there was no proof that Aunt Natsuhi was innocent. Aunt Ava, Ava, bitch! This is not the fucking time to play your petty ass games! Be serious for a second, damn! No. If you view Beatrice's letter as one of grandfather's complicated pranks, and think of his crime as an extension of that, then there's more than enough reason to suspect even grandfather. Also, Aunt Natsui thought the criminal was on the outside, but Aunt Ava thought the criminal was on the inside. In short, it was a question of whether or not a 19th person exists. That same question has been repeated endlessly since last night's dinner with the, with the letter from the witch who called herself Beatrice. So was the culprit among us, or not. And did the witch Beatrice exist, or not? If you assume that something as stupid as a witch can't exist, you're basically saying that one of these relatives here who share a common bloodline is the culprit. If that was too unpleasant, it will be much more it will be much more comfortable to simply accept the fairy tale like character of the witch. A witch. A witch drawing a bizarre magic circle and offering human sacrifices. If I could accept that rubbish, I'd be able to trust all the people in this room. However, damn common sense got in the way. It kept repeating that witches don't exist. In that case, the culprit must be among us. In the middle of the seemingly endless rain, none of us could break the silence. That broke the damn silence, fuck! I want to read these right quick. Okay, let's start with Kenzo. 
disappeared from his study unnoticed. Kenzo's study has everything from a bed to a toilet. He does occasionally go out for a walk on a whim without telling anybody, and his disappearance invariably leads to a huge uproar throughout the house. He usually comes back as soon as he gets hungry. Usually. Prowse, his course was found in the Rose Garden. It's the beginning of everything. Prowse's wife manages the household of the Ashur Head family in place of her husband, who takes little interest in such matters. She was in charge of all preparations and arrangements. She possesses a strong sense of responsibility and a great deal of pride. However, neither her husband nor his siblings understand her well, so her position is far from enviable. Prowse and Natsui's daughter. Absence of any irregularities, it is thought that she will eventually inherit the headship of the Ushirumiya family, or technically her husband will. However, she seems to have no interest in this. She was born with weak with weak bronchi and is sometimes assailed by sudden asthma attacks. Attending physician and longtime friend, he once ran a hospital on Nijima, but he turned it over to his son and now enjoys his old age in peace. Now that Kenzo's constant suspicion has reached extraordinary heights, Nanto is one of the few people he trusts. Thanks to Nanto's big heart and nature, he's always been able to continue his friendship with Kenzo despite the latter's tendency to fly into rage at the slightest provocation. Kenzo's second child, hostile towards her brother Kraus and opposes him whenever she can, from issues dealing with the family fortune to the question of who will succeed the headship. Normally, she would have lost her place in the Shiremiya register upon her marriage, but she managed to forcibly overcome this by leaving having her husband take her family name. Hideyoshi, he took his wife's name upon their marriage and became a member of the family. He therefore does not possess the spiteful genes passed down through his Shiremiya family's members, and his bright smile is very refreshing at his family conference. He started his business from scratch and now works as the president of a medium-sized restaurant chain. George, even Hideyoshi's son, affable young man liked by everyone in the family, currently studying as an assistant to his father's company, and it seems he dreams of making it his own one day. As the oldest of the four cousins, he acts as their leader and arbitrator. His course was found inside the Rose Garden storehouse. His face has been smashed after death. He has a right to lament his ill fortune. Her course was found in the Rose Garden, smashed after death. She was chosen by the demon's roulette. That's all there is to it. Son of Rudolph and his first wife, Asumu. When his father married a second wife shortly after Asumu's death, Battle rebelled and went to live with his grandparents on his mother's side. However, both of these grandparents passed away, and he has now returned to the Ushiramiya family after six years. The family conference is a chance for him to renew his friendship with his cousins after six year gap. Leader of the servant Genji, leader of the servants who works for the Ushiramiya family. He has served Kenzo longer than any other and is the person trusted by that old man. Since he serves Kenzo directly, Kraus and Natsui think of him as a spy. Rosa. Her corpse was found inside the Rose Garden storehouse. Her face seems to have been smashed after death. I'll get to see you again, so I don't feel lonely. Rosa's daughter. Her, her father's identity is unknown. She can't shake off the habit of speaking like a young child, which often earns her a scolding. She has no interest in studying or making friends, but is very interested in things concerning the occult and black magic, thanks to her excellent powers and memorization. She knows all kinds of obscure trivia. Servant Shannon. Her corpse was found inside the Rose Garden. It seems the side of her head was smashed after her death. Don't worry, everyone will be revived in the Golden Land. Young Servant. He performs his duties silently and diligently but is not so highly regarded as a servant due to his unsociable nature. There are multiple other servants with the on in their name and in their pseudonyms. He and Shana just happened to be the ones on duty that day. Servant Goda. His corpse was found inside the Rose Garden storehouse. His face seems to be smashed in after his death. How unfortunate. Apparently he was supposed to be the on duty in the guest house. This elderly woman is a part-timer who Though she has quit her job several times along the way, has served the family for a great many years in total. She is crafty and more than competent when it comes to, comes to performing her duties, but because of her chattiness and love for rumors, she is not highly regarded as a servant. That's the end of the episode, guys. If y'all enjoyed, like, subscribe, leave a comment, or read them all, tap into the next one. This shit is crazy.
there's really not much else to say but that like this shit is actually fucking insane holy shit um there's not much more to say i'm looking forward to this i'm looking forward to what what, what goes down but peace out i love y'all tap into the next one